So uh, just to start with something a little bit interesting. Um, so I don't know if you know, when you take odd numbers, Um, you get perfect squares, right? Four is two squares, nine, three squares, 16, four squared. And so if you add odd numbers. It should be a seven, right? Ooh, sorry. See, this is what happens when I don't know how to add. <laughs> um, I was uh, thinking about how would one prove this to be true, that any time you add odd numbers, you're going to get a perfect square. And there's a nice geometric way to do it, and it goes like this. So, so 1 plus 3 gives you 4. And what, what's special about an odd number is that you can draw it as an L. So here's a 3, right? If I have a 1 to start with, 1 plus 3 is a square. It's a 4, right? So if I have a 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, that's a square. If I have a 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, that's a square. So it's just the fact that you can take an odd number and represent it as an L, even, and then a dot to be the, the odd number, you can produce a square. All right. So that's our little foray into algebra. OK. So um, today what I want to show you is some more uh, results regarding um, learning and fitting in regression. Um, yes, uh, on, on Tuesday, we talked about the normal equation. Here's the normal equation. So if you want to minimize the squared error um, and you have a vector feature space x, here's the vector space features. And we have a set of weights. We had the normal equation that told us if you have all the data represented by the vector y, and we have the matrix X to represent all the inputs that we've received, then we have a way to uh, uh, find the solution to minimizing the squared error. We had a couple of um, uh, uh, iterative algorithms that approximated this. We had steepest descent, where we had average error and we had LMS where we didn't have anything but the current data we don't have so this wasn't batch learning so this is batch learning so in LMS we had this And this could have gave us a way to also um, minimize our error. Um, I want to show you a different way to approach our problem, a way that's going to give us something similar to the LMS. And what was interesting about LMS, it had this normalization error. And I want to show you where, where we can drive that a different way. And this is called the newton raphson method. And the idea is to minimize a function using um, its gradient as well as its second derivative. So the gradient is the first derivative. The second derivative gives us a little bit more information about the shape of that function. I'm going to show you how we can find the minimum of a quadratic 
um, uh, function in single step using um, the newton raphson technique. So I'm going to begin with uh, uh, simplification. Suppose the thing that we're looking for, w, is a scalar. So it's just, it's just one number that we're looking for. And so we have some space of w that we're searching. We have some function, j. This is our loss function. And here's what we want. We want this point here. And if we were to find it, this would be w star. But we're out here someplace. And we want to know how do we go from w to w star. How do we find w star? So a simple technique would be to use a representation of this function, our cost, at w star and use a Taylor series expansion for this function and see what, what would happen. So suppose we're out here, but we want to get to here. We want to know how do we change w to go from where we are to the minimum of this function. And so if we use a Taylor series expansion, here's what we're going to get. So this function, j, our loss function, at its optimum location, w star, that's equal to the same function at where we are, w, plus the derivative of that function evaluated at w times w star minus w plus one half the second derivative evaluated at w times w star minus w squared. And then we can continue this. We can have the one third factorial of the third derivative evaluate at w, w star minus w cubed, so on. So that's the Taylor series expansion of our function j at w star, represented in terms of the function j at w and all its derivatives there. Okay? All right, so why is this useful for us? So first, in all the kinds of problems we've, no we've been working on, j is a quadratic function of our unknown w. So what that means is that we're going to have a second derivative, but we're not going to have a third derivative. So that means that we can write j at w star to be equal to j at w plus the first derivative at w w star minus w plus one half of the second derivative at w, w star minus w squared. Okay, so we can also write that there's something about the first derivative of our function at w star. So let's look at this. So what's the first derivative of j evaluated at w star? Say again? Zero. Zero, yes. Right? Because that's the minimum. So its first derivative is zero. So let's write the first derivative using the Taylor expansion. So that's the first derivative at w plus the second derivative at w times w star minus w. So this w star minus w, this is the change that we want. So if we solve for it, if we just solve this equation for the change that we want, delta, we have delta is equal to minus the first derivative evaluated at w divided by the second derivative evaluated at w. This is an important little piece of information that we just got because it tells us if you want to go to the optimum weight, take your current weight, add to it an increment delta, which is equal to w minus the first derivative of your loss function evaluated w divided by 
the second derivative evaluated at w. So we'll wait till you catch up. Let's go back now to what we had. So you see how this is being divided by something here? So this, I'm going to show you, is the first derivative of your cost with respect to w. This, this term here, sorry, this term including x. This, sorry, this thing underneath is the second derivative, which is what we get from our newton raphson technique. So this was the case if w was a scalar. What if w is a vector? So my j is defined now in many, many dimensions. So there's a scalar, so there's this function j as a function of this vector w. There's some location in this w space where that j is minimum. And I want to find that, um, that location. So j itself is scalar. But w is a vector. All right, so my loss function is a scalar, but my w is a vector. That's OK. So this function j evaluated at w star, so I want to now write the Taylor series expansion for you, given that j is a scalar, but w is a vector. So that's as before, this is j evaluated at w, plus we're going to have um, this change that we're going to have to make in our um, position. So we're going to have the first derivative of j evaluated at w, right? But this is going to be multiplied by this delta, the change that we're going to make. So if I define delta as w star minus w, then this in the front of it is going to be delta transpose times this. So delta transpose times this, derivative of j with respect to w, this is a vector of size w. This is a vector of size w. w transpose times this is going to give us a scalar. The second derivative, I'm going to have a 1 half here. I'm going to have a j second derivative with respect to w. What's the der second derivative of j with respect to w? What is, what is this thing? Is it a vector or is it a matrix? It's a matrix. So what is j? j is a, is a scalar. What does that mean? That means that it's an equation that has a bunch of w's in it, right? And fine, it's an equation, but it's just going to give us a number. So when I say find its first derivative with respect to w, that means you're going to take that equation and find its derivative with respect to w1, w2, w3, w4, wd, whatever is the size of w. And now you're going to get a vector. So now, you're going to find the derivative of that again. That's what a second derivative means. So you're going to take the first derivative, which is a vector, find this derivative with respect to another vector. So that means that the first element of the vector gets its first derivative with respect to the first element of that vector. Then the second, then the third, then the fourth, that becomes a row. Then you do it again and do it again. So j is a scalar. Its first derivative with respect to a vector is a vector. Its second derivative with respect to a vector is a matrix. So this is a matrix of size w by w. Whatever is the size of w, I'm going to get you know, a square matrix. So in order for me to get a scalar now, I'm going to multiply it by delta transpose times delta. This is, corresponds to this squared. If w was a scalar, then I would have 1 half times the second derivative times delta squared. If w is a vector, I have 1 half times delta transpose times second derivative times delta. This is how we get a scale. So that's the t 
Taylor series expansion of a scalar function when it depends on a vector, size w. Okay, so now the second step for me is to know what is the first derivative evaluated at w star. And that's equal to the first derivative evaluated at w plus the second derivative evaluated at w. So that would be j w, second derivative value of w times delta. And that's equal to zero. And you can check to see if my, you know, if my math is right here, whether these are multiplying by the right sizes or not. And I think I'm okay. From this, we can write that the first derivative evaluated at w is equal to minus the second derivative times delta, which means the change that I should make is minus the second derivative evaluated at w inverse times the first derivative evaluated at w. So if w is a vector, the change that I should make is the derivative of my loss function with respect to w multiplied by the inverse of the second derivative evaluate w, which means that w should become whatever it was minus some weight times the second derivative evaluate at w inverse times the first derivative evaluate at w. So you can compare that with this. So you see this had a, in the denominator because it was a scalar this has it as an inverse because it's a matrix. Okay. I have a question. Yeah, sure. Why is there a constant for this one but not for the should be both of them. Yeah. Oops, sorry. Yeah. So if you do it by delta, you are taking one step to completely remove your error. And if you put a, you know, eta in front of it, then you say, I'm going to take some fraction of it. But in this way, it normalizes that error based on the size of the input that you had. So let's apply this to see what we get. Now suppose your estimate, oh, I had, is w transpose x. And your loss function is what we had before, the expected value of the error squared. And, you know, we have this rule that we just learned that we say that we're going to update our weight so that it's whatever was previously minus some constant times the second derivative of my loss function evaluated at w inverse times the first derivative evaluated at w. So let's see what are these first and second derivatives. So the first derivative of j evaluated at w. So we want to find the derivative of this. The first derivative of that function. So it's going to be 2 over n, the sum i is equal to 1 to n of y of i minus w transpose xi times minus xi. That's the first derivative. OK. What's the second derivative? So the second derivative of this function. So this is now a vector. This is a scalar multiplied by x, which is a vector. So the second derivative. The second derivative is going to be 2 over n times the sum of i is equal to 1 to n times the derivative of this component here, which is w transpose xi times xi. So we want to find the derivative of this with respect to w. 
let's see what that is. So W transpose times Xi. This here is a scalar, right? And what is it going to look like? It's going to look like this. W1 x1 of i plus W2 x2 of i plus blah, 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 blah. It's just a number. That's multiplying by a vector of x. However, number x as we have. So that's what this is. This is going to become a vector when we're done with it. We're multiplying a scalar times a vector. So when we find its derivative with respect to w, we want to find the derivative of this times this with respect to w1. Then we want to find the derivative of this times this with respect to w2, and so forth, until we're done with that. Then we're going to do the same thing for this element here. So derivative of this thing with respect to w it's going to be equal to matrix. And the first element is going to have x1 squared in it. Why? Because this times x1 is going to be the first element that we're going to find as a derivative with respect to x1. It's going to have x1 squared in there, right? Two x1s. The next one is going to have x1, x2 in it. The next one is going to have x1, x3 in it, so forth. And then this is going to become x2, x1, and then so forth. So the derivative of this thing with respect to w is going to be a derivative of this times this vector with respect to w. And we're going to get a matrix that's going to look like that. And what is this matrix? This is equal to x of i times x of i transpose. So the second derivative of our loss with respect to w is 2 over n times sum of i is equal to 1 to n times xi, xi transpose. OK, so we have the first derivative. Here's the first derivative here. We have the second derivative. Here it is. So now we can write our learning rule. w of n plus 1 is equal to w of n plus some fraction of the second derivative, 1 over n, the sum, i is equal to 1 to n, xi, xi transpose, inverse, times 1 over n times what was our first derivative, which is this. This is the first derivative. This is the second derivative. It's inverse. OK, do you see it? Yeah, Budri. Is there a minus sign? So minus eight. Yeah, I think I dropped the minus here. No, it's okay. Right, so yeah, so this is Yeah, you're right. Thank you for that. So you have a minus sign in uh, the first derivative. So oh, yeah, that's yeah, why. You have a minus sign. Yeah, there. yeah. So you come to the minus sign all the way up there for a plus sign. There. Yeah, thank you for asking. So there would be a minus here, which I'm going to take care of it there. Yeah. So I'm going to put a minus here. Excellent question. OK, we can take derivatives 
of vectors. To get matrices, we can take derivative of scalars to get vectors. Okay, so a couple of other simple things about this process. Um, we can have weighted errors. So you can, you can assign weight to errors, so you can make certain errors more important than other weights, other errors. So what does that mean? So suppose you have some cost of W that says, um, I'm going to look at my data, and when I compute my cost, I'm going to assign some number P that's going to say some errors are more important than other errors. So I'm going to weigh the errors based on this, this scalar P. So sometimes my errors are important, sometimes they're not so important. So we can represent this, this problem this way. We can say matrix P is, is this diagonal matrix with these elements, little p, so that my loss function can be written as follows. So this is all data I observed. And this is all the weights, and that's all the x's. So what I did is that I weighted my um, errors by the matrix P. And so what does this mean? So J is equal to now 1 over n. Let's multiply that through. Y transpose PY minus W transpose X transpose PY. Um, minus y transpose p x w plus w transpose x transpose p x w. OK, so I want to find the derivative of j with respect to w and set it equal to 0 and find my optimum weight. So the derivative of this function with respect to w, I'm going to have 1 over n in the front. Um, this term, of course, this is a scalar. j is a scalar. And this and this are going to combine to give me um, 2 times minus 2 times um, w transpose x transpose py because this transpose is equal to this and I can transpose it because j is a scalar. So the derivative of j with respect to w is the derivative of this with respect to w which is going to be minus 2 x transpose p times y. Then I have this term plus this is a quadratic function. I'm going to get a 2 x transpose p x w. So dj dw is a vector. And you notice that everything that I have has a vector at the end of it. So it's going to end up being something times a vector. So it's going to end up becoming a vector of the right size. So from this, I have, I said this is equal to 0. I have minus x transpose py uh, plus plus x transpose p x w is equal to 0. So then I have, um, I have w is going to be equal to x transpose p x minus 1 x transpose py. So if I want to weight my errors, if I want to weigh them based on some um, matrix P, my normal equation is going to end up having a component in there based on the P that I had. Now why is this useful? 
Let me give you an example of it for image analysis, for um, doing fMRI. So in image analysis, like fMRI, what you have is that you have n voxels, and then you have t time points for each voxel. t goes from 1 to t. And so for voxel n, what you do is you say, well, I'm, I made some measurements, y of n, and this is a vector t by 1. And I have some matrix x, which is called design matrix, which is t by p. And my unknown is this thing beta sub n. For every voxel, you're going to get some coefficient vector beta. And this is size p by 1. And then there's some noise, epsilon, associated with your measurement. And this is t by 1. And so the basic problem is nothing at all different than our normal problem. So for every voxel, what you do is that you find this beta. And this vector beta is going to be equal to you know, x transpose x minus 1 x transpose y of n. All right, so that's just a normal equation. But why, why is it that we want to do something more than this? Well, because you, know, you, you might have an image where at some time point, little t, there was some motion or something. Something bad happened to your image. So maybe the person in the scanner moved their head. Maybe something bumped the table. So that your fit to the data will not be equally good at every time point. At one time point, it may be much worse than others. So what you want to do, you want to still fit your data, but you want to weigh the fit so that at that time point, if you have big errors, it's OK, because you had bad data anyway. That's the idea. All right, so how would we do that? All right, here's, here's, the, here's the idea. So variance of this noise, epsilon n, is going to be, normally, we're going to assume it to be constant. But in this case, it's not going to be constant. It's going to be something that's going to depend on time. So I'm going to say the first data point, the second data point, and the last data point is going to have some variable s multiplied by some um, scalar sigma squared. And this is equivalent to my matrix P that I had above. I'm going to call it V, sigma squared n. So you see what I'm doing is I'm going to say the noise in my fit is not going to be constant throughout all time. There's going to be some time, maybe the second data point that I got, where I know something bad happened. And I'm not going to care about the fit there as well as I'm going to care about the fit the rest of the time. That's going to be represented by this matrix V. And so if I want to now find the optimum fit for that voxel, I get x transpose v minus 1, x minus 1, x transpose v, y, n. So it's a weighted representation of my fit. And so this is one of the ways by which you um, basically take into account the fact that in a data stream that you've collected and you're fitting it to a model, not every data point is as good as every other data point. Um, in your notes, I have a, a reference to a paper where basically we expand this. If you're interested in getting more into this topic of how do you fit non-stationary signals, um, where you can estimate you know, what these weights should be when you fit it to a model like this. The basic idea being that you want to take into account the fact that you know, there's some th events have occurred during your data stream that makes it so that some data are not as good as others. Essentially, weighing your data based on the, how good the model is fitting your, your data. All right. Any questions, guys? Yeah. Uh, would that be modeling your data based on your model? Yeah, it kind of is. 
it is basically saying, how can I model my data, weigh it based on how well it fits that data? It is a way to do that, yeah. You can do it all, you can, there may be other ways to do it, so that there may be an objective measure of motion or something like that that you can use to put in there. That's another way to do it. Okay, so we've been talking about loss functions. And I want to now describe to you an experiment where it tried to estimate what's the loss function for people. And the experiment is going to teach us something about how do we, first, how do we design a beautiful experiment? And second, how do we find the answer to this kind of a problem? So if you had one kind of loss function, you might have a certain behavior. But if you have a different kind of loss function, you might do something different. And the idea is, how do you make an experiment so you can estimate this, this thing that we've been calling a loss function? So this is a paper that appeared about 12 years ago. And you have it in your lecture notes. Um, but I want to go briefly through the math so we can see what was the idea, how did they do the experiment, and what was the result that they got. So the experiment itself is based on the notion that we could potentially have very different kinds of loss functions. So, so you know, one, of, one kind of loss, so you have some error, and we want to define your loss. And you could have a very simple loss, and it could look like this. So if you didn't have an error, your loss is zero, and if you had an error, your loss is one. So what, this, what does this mean? So suppose that you're at the arcade. You go to these games where there are, there's a bucket there, and you throw the ball. If the ball goes in, you win. If the ball goes someplace else, you lose. You don't lose more if you miss the bucket by a long ways or by a small amount. So you get it only if it goes in, and you don't get it if, you, you know, if it doesn't go in. So this is how most games are played. Does that make sense? That's kind of a loss function. So, of course, you can have a different kind of loss function. Your loss function could be, you know, what I care about is how close I am. So this is the absolute value of, of this. So let's, let's draw this. So suppose on the x-axis I put my error. I could have no error. I could miss to the left by one centimeter, I could miss to the left by two centimeter, I could miss to the right by one centimeter, miss to the right, miss to the right by two centimeters. And I'm going to plot on the y-axis the loss. So this first function says all that matters is whether you got it in the basket or not. It's going to look like this. That is loss of y tilde is equal to 0 or 1. Yeah? Can you use another color as well? Oh, another color. How do I do that? Ah, beautiful. Thank you, Esa. So that was our first loss. We could also have a loss that looks like this. Right, so this is the absolute value of y tilde. Wow, I feel so professional. All right, we can have another loss. So loss, oh no. Okay, my loss could be, you know, some function of this guy that's not raised to the power one. So maybe raised to the power alpha. Or it could be my usual loss. So this is like, for example, you know, I could have loss of my squared loss or whatever. So, you know, you could draw your losses here. So I could have it something like this. Right, that's a squared loss. It's 
So the question is, when people are playing a game where you give them points for being, you know, as close as possible to something, what, what, is, what is their loss function? How are they changing their behavior? What do they care about? So, in principle, we, what we want to do is do this. So we want to find some parameter w that minimizes the expected value of the loss, y tilde, given w. So if there's some parameter w that you're controlling, we've been talking about weights, but it could be whatever parameter you want. When we say optimize behavior, what we mean is that you're going to find the parameter that minimizes the expected value of the loss. So in this experiment, what they're going to do is that they're going to control this w. And they're going to ask, well, all right, if you can control this w, where would you put, you know, what, what, how does your behavior change? So what is this expected value? So in principle, the expected value of the loss, of course, is by definition the probability of the loss times the value of the loss integrated over the errors. And the experiment that they had was, was pretty simple. They had, you know, a target, which was a line. You had your finger. And what you did is that you placed your finger wherever you want it in this, along, this ang along this axis. And that's, we're going to call this W. This course is a scalar. So you can place your finger over here to the left, over here in the middle, over here to the right. And there are these P's that come out of the computer depending on where your finger is. And the idea is that place your finger so that on average the P's land as close as possible to the target. This was the instruction that was given to the people. Now, what did they do in this experiment is that they, they manipulated this. They manipulated the probability of the error given where the hand of the subject was. And for every one of these probabilities, they figured out, well, where did the person place their hand in order to maximize this goal? And from that, they try to estimate what is their loss function. And what I'm going to do in the next half hour to tell you how do they do it. So they try to estimate what is the loss function for a person when they're given the task, like you saw here. Place your finger so that on average, these P's that are coming out of this finger-like thing are as close as possible to the target. Minimize your loss. And the question is, what is your loss? How do you describe that? So let me give you a simple example. Suppose that you place your finger out here. I'm going to call that W1. And when you place your finger over there, the probability of error given W looks like this. So if you had your finger at W1, here's would be the probability of your error. On the other hand, if you had your finger at W2, here would be the probability of the error, given that W is equal to W2. So I want to compare, what is it better? Is it better to have your finger over here? Or is it better to have your finger over here? And, and we're going to do it with various loss functions. So what was our loss function? So suppose our loss function looks like this. is a delta function.
So, you know, what I care about is whether I get the P's on the line, and I don't care how far away it is. Suppose this is what I have as my loss function. So, what does this mean when I compare it with this? So, what's the expected value of my loss of y tilde given w? That's equal to the integral of the probability of the error given w times the loss of the error given w when I integral, when I integrate my error. So, the expected value of loss of error, given that w is equal to w2, that's equal to w2 is here, right? So that was our function here. We're at 0. I'm going to multiply this function, this function that you see here, by this loss, and then I'm going to integrate it. So when I do that, I get something like this, and I'm going to have to integrate it, which is this area underneath it. That's if I have my finger at w2. The expected value of my loss, given that I'm that's equal to so now this function is going to look like this. its integral is this. Okay, so from this I can tell that the expected value of my loss of my error when w is equal to w2 is less than the expected value of my loss when w is equal to w1. If loss is this delta function. So I should pick w2 in this case. I should put my finger at w2. So what does that mean? So if your loss function is loss of error, given w is equal to 0 if there is no error, 1 if there is an error, then what you should do is put your finger so that the mode of the probability falls on the location y tilde is equal to 0, right? So if your loss function is, if all you care about is how many, um, how many times you're going to get a hit, then what you should do is to place your finger so that this probability function has its mode, the most probable event, is at 0 error. That's how you minimize the expected value of that loss function. If all you care about is getting most number of baskets, then what you should do is to take the probability distribution of your errors and change your game so that you get the mode of that probability distribution centered at the basket. You don't care about those tails. All you care about is the mode. That's what our answer is here. So what in the experiment, what they did is that they described probability of error given the finger position as the sum of two probabilities, 1 minus a times the first probability of error given finger position plus a second, a, sorry,
times P2 of error given W. And they did these as normal distributions. So they had one normal distribution, called that P1. Then they had another normal distribution, called that P2. And by adding these two and weighing it by A1, by A, they get P of Y tilde given W. So you get something that looks like this. So it has a long tail. So if this is the probability of error given your behavior, then what you want to do is that basically find the W that maximizes the probability of error being 0 given W, which is the mode of the distribution. Mode of the error distribution. So if we were to take this parameter A, so this A is what they're manipulating. So the subject sits in front of the monitor, the computer picks an A. That tells you the relationship between what the subject is doing, where they're putting their hand, and the probability distribution of the errors that they're going to see. So let me go over it again one more time. So the computer picks an A. That's describing this probability distribution, which says, what's the error that they're going to see given that they have their finger at some location? So if the A is, you know, is 1, then they're going to see this normal distribution centered out here. If the A is 0, they're going to see a normal distribution centered out here. If A is something in between, they're going to see a function that looks like this. So A goes from small number to 1. At each probability distribution, probability distribution of error, they measure what does the subject do? Where do they put their finger? And if all the subject cared about was the number of times the ball, the P, fell in the basket, then what they should see is that their finger location should change with the mode of the probability distribution. Because that's what maximizes the number of times the ball falls in the basket, the number of minimizes this loss function. So if the loss function was, did it get into the basket or not, then you should change your behavior so that as you move from one distribution to the other distribution, you change your W, your finger position, so you stay basically at the maximum um, location of the probability distribution, which is the mode. And so it turns out that, you know, if we say that the goal y is here, this is the goal, and we say w is on this axis and this is 0, then basically as a goes from 0 to 1, w should change something like this. If your objective is to minimize the loss function that says, you know, Delta is what matters to me. What matters to me is getting the number as many as many balls in the basket as I can. That's the loss function associated with that policy. So now we can do the same thing for all our other loss functions. So remember, we had other loss functions that we could consider. So I just did this one for you. This loss. But we could do it also for the absolute value. We could also do it for the squared value. And let me now do it for the squared value so we can see what that looks like. And so for each one of those loss functions, you're going to get an optimum behavior. And then you look at what did the person do, and you compare what the theoretical optimum behavior is to what the person did, and you find what is their loss function, which is the one closest to what they actually did. So, so far, what we found is that if what they're maximizing is the number of balls that falls in the basket, then they should change their finger location based on this parametric way of representing the probability of error given the finger position. So A is a parametric way by which we change this probability distribution. And this probability distribution tells us 
how does finger position relate to error that I'm going to see? Okay, let me stop for a second, see if you have any questions about that. All right, so let me now show you what it would look like if my loss function was not the delta function, but was squared error. So if this is my error, then, you know, my squared function That's supposed to be the minimum there. It would look like that. So that's the loss function that we can also consider. So that's the loss of my error is error squared. So we want to find behavior w that minimizes The expected value of my loss of error given w. And in this case, that loss is my error squared. So what I want to know is that what should the person be doing with their finger if I change this probability distribution using this parameter a if their loss function is distance squared to the target? So we just did it for if the, if the objective was to get as many balls in the basket as possible. Now I want to know what, what would it look like if the objective is not to get as many balls in the basket as possible, but the objective is to minimize the square distance to the basket. So what would that look like? So what I need to know is basically this expected value of um, my error squared. So what's the variance? of my error, given w. That's the expected value of my error squared, given w, minus the expected value of my error, given w, quantity squared. And so expected value of my error squared, given w, the thing that I want to minimize is the variance of my error plus the expected value of my error squared. So what they're going to do is going to they're going to have this probability distribution of your errors that's going to be parameterized by this parameter a. There's going to be a normal distribution. This is the first uh, probability that's going to have a mean and some variance and there's going to be a second distribution that's going to have a different mean and different variance. Right, so this is my probability of error given my behavior is going to be described by sum of two normal distributions where the parameter A is going to be controlled by the experimenter. So what I want to know is, okay, what's my expected value of error given W? What is this guy? And what is the variance of my error? given w. Why do I need to know these things? Because in order for me to know what's the expected value of my error squared, I need to know the variance of my error, I need to know my expected value of the error. If I know that, then I can find a w that minimizes the expected value of my loss function. Do you see what, what, why I'm doing this? So let me go over it one more time. I want to find what is the behavior w that I should do if what I'm trying to minimize is the squared error. So my loss is the squared error. So in order for me to minimize this loss, what I need to know is what is the expected value of it. The expected value of this loss, this term here, is going to depend on um, the probability, the variance of that probability, which depends on the squared value and the mean of it. So what is, what is this term here? What's the expected value of my, um, of my loss? 
that's, we can figure that out. So if we have some random variable x that we describe as probability as being a1 times normal mu1 sigma1 squared plus a2, some another normal mean mu2 and sigma2 squared. If the sum of, if, if my sum random variable is described as the sum of two normal distributions, what's the expected value of x? That's equal to a1 times the integral of this normal mu1 sigma1 squared times x dx plus a2 times this normal <coughs> mu2 sigma2 squared x dx, which means that the expected value of a random variable that is the sum of two normal distributions is a1 mu1 plus a2 mu2. The variance of that random variable, so if I have a random variable x, that's the sum of two normal distributions. Its variance is going to be the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x quantity squared. So what is that? The expected value of x squared is equal to a1 times a normal mu1 sigma1 squared x2 x squared dx plus a2 a normal mu2 sigma2 squared x squared dx and then I have this expected value of x quantity squared which is a1 mu1 plus a2 mu2. So I can compute the variance and the expected value of a random variable when it is the sum of two um, normal distributions. So when I have probability of my error given w being equal to some sum of uh, two normal distributions, some normal mu1 sigma1 squared plus um, a times another normal mu2 sigma2 squared, it turns out that this variance using the, its expected value and its variance can be computed using what I just showed you. So the variance of my error given w is not a function of w. On the other hand, the expected value of my error given w is going to be equal to basically 1 minus a times this mean w minus mu1 plus um, a times w minus mu2, it's going to be some function of w, some linear function of w. And so the expected value of the squared error given w is going to be the variance of this w error given w plus the expected value of the error given w squared, which is going to be, in this case, equal to just w squared. And so the optimum w star argument of w, the expected value of error given w, is going to be 0, which means that if you take my parameter a, the thing that changes the uh, probability distribution from 0 to 1, and if you look at how it changes, so I shouldn't change my finger position. I should just keep it at 0 as you vary the probability distribution. So remember, we had this probability distribution that shifted from this to this as you changed A. And the variance, it turns out, of this distribution wasn't changing. 
and which meant that if I wanted to minimize the squared error, what I should do is that I should not change my finger, keep it precisely underneath the target, because that's what would be minimizing the squared error, the squared difference between the places where the P's end up and the distance to the, basically the, the, the target. So if I care about maximizing the number of times the P's fall in the basket, this is what I should do. If I care about minimizing the loss being the distance squared to the basket, I sh this is what I should do. What do people do? It turns out that people do something, you know, something that looks like this. Something in between. Which made them basically say that the loss that people were minimizing looked like something that looked like this. Something close, but not exactly equal to a squared error. So the experiment was, suppose you have a loss function. I want to know what your loss function is. I'm going to present you with a problem where I'm going to manipulate the errors that you see depending on your behavior. You pick your behavior. I'm going to show you errors. And then I'm going to ask, how do you change your behavior to minimize the error? But the problem is, what is the loss function? I don't know the loss function. And so the way you change your behavior, I'm going to model using various loss functions, going from a delta function to a linear change to a quadratic change. And then I'm going to say, all right, which is the one that's closest to what you do? And what they found was that it was a loss function that said something like error raised to the power of 1.75. Okay. This paper appeared in PNAS about 15 years ago. Okay. Yeah. So why is it that um, in the perceptron and the other learning rules is assumed that the error is squared? Yeah, it's just a mathematical simplicity. It makes it so that we can find derivatives easily. Okay. So did that come first or did this come first? Did it already know that it's 1.75 because of simplicity they made it 2, or did, did a 2 come first and then the, how the does this? 2 came first. 2 came first. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. So why, why did it happen? Yeah, the 2 has been around since 1960s. Okay. Yeah, squared error has been around for a long time. This was the first paper to try to estimate biological loss functions. But where did, so what did it, where, where did that 2 come from? 2? Yeah. Where uh, did the square come from? Oh, just that it's finding derivatives of squared things is easy. That's all. It's just a mathematical nicety. Okay, guys, thank you so much. I'll see you Monday.